you are making the world a better place by listening to the Joy of Living podcast. This is your guide to achieving a more purposeful, powerful, and positive life. Join Barry Shore in unlocking the best version of you and becoming happier, healthier, and wealthier. And now, here's your ambassador of joy, Barry Shore. Good day, beautiful, bountiful, beloved, immortal beings and good looking people. Remember, you're good looking because you're always looking for and finding the good. We have good in abundance on this special edition of the Joy of Living podcast because I am humbled and honored to tell you that a, a good friend and one of the most interesting and uh, fascinating people in the world of business has agreed to do a special edition with us. And his name is Gershon Distenfeld. He's been on a long podcast, and you'll look that up. It's quite amazing. Uh, Gershon has several claims to fame, but I'll, not, I'll talk about that when I bring him on. But I just want to make sure that everybody understands that this podcast, what we do, is all about you. Y-O-U. And that's the reason you tuned in, because you care the most in the whole world about you. And if you're here so you can become happier, healthier, and wealthier. And we're going to speak about wealth in just a couple of minutes. We bring on Gershon. And just want to make everybody aware again, we work with the three fundamentals of life. Number one, life has purpose. Number two, lead a purpose-driven life. You go mad, which means you can make a difference. And number three, to unlock the power and the secrets of everyday words and terms, like smile, seeing miracles in life every day, or kind, keep inspiring noble deeds. There's nobody. Nobody that I want to have with us today that inspires noble deeds when it comes to your money than Gershon Distenfeld. Gershon, welcome. What a pleasure to have you here. Please say hello to about 356,722 people around the world. <laughs> uh, hello, everyone. And thank you, Barry, for that uh, very flattering and probably exaggerated opening. But uh, I guess I'll take it. Well, you got it, baby. We like to exaggerate when it comes to goodness. So uh, we're going to, as I said, this is special edition. I'm just going to give you a thumbnail about Gershon so you'll understand why I've asked him and he's uh, agreed. Uh, the issues revolving around business from Gershon's perspective is he is the head of or the co-head of bond trading at Alliance Bernstein. It's a very well-known and respected Wall Street firm. He is the co-head of their bond department, and he's responsible for plus minus three billion dollars in trade. So he's always having to know what's going on. Three hundred billion. Three hundred. Uh, excuse me. Uh, I don't. I want. I don't want to exaggerate. Three hundred <laughs> billion in trades. Hello. Wrap your head around that one. <laughs> three, and that's what Gershon does. In addition, by the way, and I think it adds to uh, you know, it's like little bit of Tabasco sauce in his CV. He is a poker player, but not just a poker player. He is a World Series of Poker winning poker player. And he's so good that what he does with his hundreds of thousands of dollars in winnings that he donates it all. We'll talk about that because that's part of his persona. He is a giver. And I said he's giving right now his most valuable asset, which is his time. And it's done because he wants to share with people some knowledge about what it is that he does, because people know something about the stock market, something on everything, of course, but, but you have some sort of idea of what we call equities. Most people that are listening to this, you're under 35, you know what poker is, You've a game, and you may have played it once in a while or maybe Often, very few people know about bonds. Matter of fact, the only bond that 98% of people listening really know about is James. You know, you think of bond, you think of James Bond. But uh, we're going to walk through very slowly and carefully and then a little more um, deeply into the world that Gershon uh, works with. Specifically now, I've asked him, because there is so much turmoil, so much uncertainty 
in the American stock and bond market, which again is worldwide, that there's, we need to unpack some of it. So let's begin, if you'd be so kind, Gersh, and again, a huge thank you for being here. Begin with just a, a one or two minute uh, education about what is a bond and why should anybody be interested? So a bond is very simply just, it's a loan. It's a loan between someone who has money and wants to receive a return on that money and some someone or some entity that needs money. So many, many uh, institutions issue bonds, right? They provide the, they, they need the financing. So it could be, it's the government. We know the US government and governments around the world borrow money to finance their, their uh, operations and obligations. Municipalities, the local uh, water sewer plant, or or a school will borrow money as well. Um, corporations borrow money. Very often, it makes more sense for corporations to borrow money because they think they can earn a higher return than it's going to cost them. So, who invests in these securities? Um, everyday people. Um, certainly there are pension funds and endowment funds and other pools of money that invest in these bonds, um, but individuals do as well. And there's three primary reasons to invest in bonds. One is we call stability. Um, you have money that you're going to need in a year, let's say, to put a down payment on a home or pay for your child's college or something like that. You want to earn, you don't want to earn zero on it. You don't want it to sit in the bank, banks pay you essentially zero, so it's like, oh, that might change soon. Um, you want to earn some return. The second reason you might own a bond is that bonds tend to do, at least higher quality bonds, tend to do very well when, in, when the equity market is doing poorly, okay? Yields tend to go down and the price goes up. We can maybe talk more about why that is. So it could be a good diversifier for you. You can own something in your portfolio that when stocks are down, actually goes up in price. And the third reason you might own bonds is you need income. You might be a retiree, you need cash flow. And there are certain types of bonds that offer much, much higher yields than you can get at the bank. Um, you can buy high yield or bonds issued by emerging market countries at five, six, 7%. So those are the three reasons you might buy a bond. And I, I mentioned before some of the, the people that, that issue bonds, the institutions that issue bonds. So this is wonderful, and thank you for giving us the the framework so we can begin to go even deeper and discuss some of the things that are happening. Again, in the turmoil and uncertainty, that's how I say it, of the American stock market and therefore affecting the world. Uh, so let's begin again. A bond is a loan. Very nice. And many different entities will take the loan. And again, just for people like myself. So if I invest in Amazon, I uh, put in $1,000 into Amazon. Doesn't that money go to Amazon? Isn't that somewhat similar? So what is the distinction between investing in a stock such as Amazon or and buying, I don't know if Amazon issues bonds, but let's say it does, versus a, a bond from Amazon? What's the difference, the distinction between the two? Yeah, so the difference is that you buy the, the Amazon stock, you're buying a, you're buying a ownership in the com in the company. You actually are entitled to, and many companies pay it out in cash, but sometimes they're reinvested. You're entitled to a share of the profits. If you buy stock that represents 1%, obviously you're not buying 1% of Amazon, <laughs> but you buy 1% of a company, you're entitled to 1%. You own 1% of it. That means if it sells at some point, you get 1% of the proceeds. It means that you get 1% of the earnings. Sometimes you get it in cash. Oftentimes it gets reinvested in the business. A bond is different. A bond is a legal obligation. It's a contract. So if, 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 if you buy a bond from Amazon, right, Amazon agrees to pay you a coupon rate. They agree to pay you an annual rate of return on that, on that investment. Usually bonds pay twice a year. So if Amazon is issuing bonds, let's say at 4%, you would get 2% and you, you put $1,000 in, you would get $20 twice a year, equal a total of $40. And there's an obligation. A bond has a maturity date. That's when the loan is due. They have to repay the loan at that maturity date. Now, obviously, there's not a lot of risk in Amazon because it's, it's, a, it's a very stable company, a very profitable company. But the, you can invest in riskier, riskier companies, and they pay you more and more to do that. And that's a trade-off. You have to, if you want more 
return, you want more income, you want those higher coupon payments, you take the risk that they're not able to pay you back at the end of the day. So those so, are the, that's the main differences. Good. Thank you so much for that. And again, just as you said so nicely and eloquently in a very short way, there's an inverse relationship between equities and bonds. And if equities were to decline, in other words, the stock market went from 35,000 down to 34, 33, 30, and kept going down, and equities lose their value, bonds tend to increase in value. People, because companies may need to borrow more now to maintain their situation. So is that- uh, No, it's, it's, your... it's a little different, a little different than that, Barry. It's not that, it's that usually, the, the, the rates on bonds go down when the stock market goes down. And when rates on bonds go down, that means the existing value of the bonds you hold usually goes up. And, and the reason for that is very simple. Think about it. Let's use that 4% example again. If I buy a 4% bond from, from Amazon, let's use your example, and it matures in 10 years from now, it matures in 2032, okay? Now, for, for yields go down in the marketplace. And now if Amazon was to issue a new 10-year bond, it would be at three and a half percent. So think about it. In order, for it to, in order for it to make sense in the marketplace, if I could buy that 4% bond at the original price, then I would do that all day long, right? Because that's right. what the new rate is three and a half percent. So that 4% bond goes up in value. You might have to pay, you know, instead of, we call it par, which is a hundred cents on the dollar, you might have mm -hmm. to pay 102, a 2% premium to own that bond. Mm -hmm. um, and the longer the bond, the more the price goes up when the yields go down. Now, why do yields go down when, when the stock market sells off? Well, typically, um, it's people are, are they, there's an increase in demand for bonds. They want, they're willing to buy bonds because they want safety at lower yields. So that usually, not always, but usually causes the price, at least of higher quality bonds. If you look at some of the lower quality bonds, that's why fixed income is, or bonds as we call it, is, is, so, is so fascinating. There's many, there's one stock market, there's many different types of bonds. And if you talk about, if you're investing in more riskier bonds, those could also go down in price at the same time the stock market's going down. So bonds is not some simplistic thing, I just want to invest in bonds. You have to determine who are you lending to, how much risk you want to take, and how much risk do you want to take just based on yields changing? The longer the bonds you buy, it's a concept we call duration, the more the sensitivity is to changes in rates. When rates go down, the bond price goes up. And when rates go up, the bond price goes down. So for, again, thank you so much for this. Let's get very specific. Uh, we are now in the month of February. I think it's the 17th of February. The Fed, the Federal Reserve of the United States of America, has announced. Now I'm, I'm talking to you now as a poker player. You know, we call this a tell. You know, you can read people's faces of what sometimes what they have. Are they bluffing? Are they serious? Et cetera, et cetera. The the Fed is announcing that come March, in just a few weeks, interest rates will rise. Now they are at historic lows. You can't get much lower than they are right now because they're almost negative, but they're just at basically just over 0%. And the Fed is announcing it's going to raise rates. So they're telling us what's going to happen because of three things. Number one, inflation. Inflation, is, official inflation rate, 7.5%. Reality rate is probably closer to 12 or 15. <laughs> uh, that's number one. Number two is because that one of the ways that you dampen inflation is because by raising interest rates historically. And number three, because it's a political ploy. I say that. It's the 2022. This is the midterm elections coming up. So there's a great need to make sure that the economy has some stability to it. But let's talk about this Although, issue. So Barry, the Fed is supposed to be an apolitical institution. It doesn't right, work out that way. Oh, to. very. That's a very important point that Gershon just made, and he's right to correct me on that. The Fed is non-political, in quotation marks, supposed to be. Uh, but and as anything in life, and especially in this world today, families are supposed to be non-political. But let's leave that as, put on the table. 
but they've announced they're going to raise rates. And there are some, I think Bank of America said, the Fed will raise the rate seven times in the next 12 months. Gershon, you're trading hundreds of billions of dollars in bonds. Give us, please, uninterrupted from me, a picture of what it means that interest rates could go up a quarter point, half a point, a point, two points. What if it got to three or four percent in the next eight, nine months? Well, I think it's important to remember, Barry, a couple of things. One, um, you know, the average of the past 40 or 50 years has been closer to 3%. So that wouldn't be so crazy. We don't expect it to get that high. But it's also important to, to remember the Fed only controls the short-term interest rate, what's known as overnight borrowing. Um, and that does have a ripple effect to the entire bond market. But the bond market is a, is a market like stocks. It's based on supply and demand for when you talk about bonds that are longer in maturity than just uh, you know overnight, instantaneous. Uh, or that are riskier. Um, so look, I, I think that clearly the reason the Fed, the reason you mentioned inflation, that's the, the, the reason the Fed is going to raise rates. Um, all else being equal, when you make it more costly to borrow, it does contract the economy, right? The, econ the reason you have inflation is the economy is overheating. There's too mm -hmm. much demand chasing too few goods. And look, inflation is really a regressive tax. Um, you, we talk about not being political, but no one really wants a regressive tax. No one wants to charge uh, people on the lower income part of the scale more. And essentially, you know, while wage growth at the lower end has been up, inflation, to your point, whether it's seven and a half percent or it's really more, has outpaced that. So uh, a person, you know, many people are worse off given that inflation. So the Fed is supposed to kind of balance two things. They're supposed to balance what was known as full employment. Right, that that almost everyone who has a job has a job now. Full employment is thought to be about an unemployment rate of about four percent, um, and then inflation. And you know, the more the more uh, those things are inversely correlated to each other. So by 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 bringing down inflation and raising rates, you may come out with some with 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 less employment. So the Fed is supposed to balance those two things. The Fed for the most of the past two decades has been more about the employment side, more about the growth of the economy, but it's having a huge impact now and that inflation is much, much higher than anyone wants to tolerate. So they have to bring the inflation down. Now, inflation is not only caused by low rates, it's also, we have a big supply chain problem right now, as we all know. So a combination of the Fed starting to hike rates and whether they do it seven times like Bank of America says, or less or more, they're going to look at where are we in the second half of the year? Is inflation still very high? Or are some of these bottlenecks in the global supply chain going to unwind? The rate hikes will slow growth a little bit and they won't have to do as much. That remains to be seen. So again, you've given us three remarkably important um, ideas to consider. You mentioned you, you are as a poker player and as a bond trader in the hundreds of billions, you have to look at things historically. And that's how you began say, look, don't be nervous about a 3%, let's say, if it goes there, 3% rate, because that is historic for us. That's been a norm for decades. So that's really important. Thank you. The other thing is, as you just mentioned, that we have not seen a rate of 7.5%. Again, that's what the government says. People know in their own pocketbooks that it's higher, but we haven't seen that in 40 years, since 1981. Sorry. And I'm older than you, and I lived through the Carter years when inflation began at 3% in the, in the first year of his presidency. And by the time he left office four years later, inflation was at double digits, again, by the government. Interest rates for borrowing for a home were at 17%. It, it was madness on a grand scale. Now, obviously, nobody wants to look and say, well, it could happen again. It could. But that, as you're saying, in a very sanguine way, and very calm, it's unlikely, certainly in the next 8 to 12 months, unlikely to, to happen like that. However, it is the role of the Fed, I believe, and please correct me if I'm off on this, to mitigate and, in quotation marks, manage 
the two processes that you mentioned, uh, full employment or employment and uh, bringing down inflationary pressures. And the wild card, speaking of poker, seems to be the supply chain. In other words, if there was a fully operational supply chain, we probably wouldn't be seeing, as I think this is what you're saying, we wouldn't be seeing the same kind of inflationary pressures. Is that correct? That's right, Barry. That's, right, Barry. That's correct. So the part of the key for the administration is to really work diligently and assiduously, great word, diligently and assiduously to get rid of that bottleneck and make sure the supply chain. Now that goes to something that you mentioned previously about alone. So I don't mean A-L-O-N-E, I mean L-O-A-N. That there are munis, municipal governments and such like that, and then sovereign states. So I'm presuming at the moment, you have to tell us that a certain countries, let's call it China, even Russia, certainly Japan, England, hold huge. I mean, I, you'll talk about it, you, I'm sure, in the trillions of dollars of our bonds. And how does that affect us in the USA? Well, it, it affects us in that it all else being equal again, it lowers the interest rates, right? There's demand for bonds. As I said before, the, the price goes up and it lowers the rate. Um, and there's also just a demand for dollar assets. For better or for worse, the dollar is still the reserve currency of the world. Um, this, you know, the euro is a great idea. That's a whole <laughs> discussion about whether it was right. good in practice or not. Um, right. And and uh, there's no real currency that that can replace the U.S. dollar. Now, bit the whole Bitcoin and blockchain uh, or a fad or a reality. No, right. No, 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 no. Phenomenon yes. is something that is interesting to be talked about, but yeah, the, the, there's no question foreign holders are they all, uh, outside of the U.S. Whether it's governments or other investors, hold a lot of a lot of dollar assets, and look, that's always a worry. If they would lose confidence in the dollar or want to flee, that would send yields in the bar, bond market up by quite a bit. So again, if we have I'm, I'm mentioning it in reality. We're talking quite openly. Um, China, in my humble opinion, is a malign influence, certainly when it comes to us. They see us not just as a competitor in the business sense, but as someone to be vanquished. I don't mean militarily, but in any way possible. In other words, uh, whether it's a hack, whether it's uh, upsetting our dollar by dumping bonds or doing things with their bonds that, that could be adverse to us. So is is that a, and again, I don't want to emphasize it because I want to talk about something else. So let's leave that for the moment. Let's talk about recession because one of the dangers, I believe, and correct me if I'm off on this, of Fed managing their situation for our economy is that these are unwieldy situations. As you said, they only represent a small amount, but their small amount is in the trillions. Um, <laughs> but the point is that you could have something like we used to call stagflation. And stagflation is a very dangerous animal because it can easily tip into recession, which is not simple to get out of and causes lots of pain. Am I correct on that? Yeah, before I answer that question directly, I want I want I think it's important to understand that people throw around a trillion dollars here, a trillion dollars there, like it's nothing. Right. <laughs> I, I'm gonna I'm putting you on the spot, Barry. I just to give some people a a a, a, a uh, just a framework. If you had you know ever lift a paper clip or a box of paper clips, you're not exactly lifting weights with them, right? How much do you think a trillion paper clips weigh? And the measurement I want you to do it is is how many mid-sized cars, so how many, let's say, Honda Civics, weigh the same as a trillion paper clips? What do you think? So I have to answer first, how much does a trillion paper clips? I mean, it's such an enormous number. And it's an it's, enormous it's, number. So uh, I, I won't put you on the spot. Uh, the answer is 850,000 cars weighs the same as a trillion paper clips. Think about that for a minute. Okay. That I, I think it's very important to understand how, how long do you think it takes 
uh, for a trillion seconds to go by. Thousands of years. The average right. person lives between two and three billion seconds. So it's it's a uh, it's an enormous enormous number. So I just wanted to say that. Anyway, to answer your question about recession. So yes, there's always a danger if the Fed um, if the Fed is too aggressive and they raise rates too far or too fast, that can cause a recession. And it might even cause a recession with still with inflation, as you point out, what we call stagflation. But there's a couple of things to remember today. The first is we are coming from very, very high levels of growth. The economy has been very, very strong. So we might see growth slow, but that doesn't necessarily mean we're going to see negative growth that we get into recession territory. And the other thing is we're starting at very, very accommodative, what we call accommodative, very, very low rates. The rate has been zero for a long time. It's actually been effectively negative, you mentioned before. Because the Fed has been buying bonds that effectively, effectively makes the rate, it's equivalent of making the rate negative. So the Fed would have a long way to go before not only did it slow growth from where we are now, but it would turn that growth negative. To your point, Barry, always a risk, but it's not something that I think we should view as a base case at the moment. This is so enlightening. Thank you so much. Uh, so again, let's just say what you mentioned 3% as. A an average over decades. So nothing, in other words, not to be feared. Certainly, three percent compared to zero or 0.25 is a large increase, but manageable for the Gershon distant fellows of the world, people who manage large portfolios and such. That's number one. Number two is that again, according to the administration, they're happy, they say, with a 2% growth rate, as opposed to what we've been seeing over the past 10 to 15 years, which is almost actually during the Obama time, it was 2% or a little bit under. During that uh, four-year clip from during Trump, it did get up into 3.5%, almost 4%. In other words, it was a very strong, aggressive economy, which may have tipped us into where we are now because it was so strong that the supply chain looked like it was just going to continue to be gigantic and everybody could work. And then, of course, the unforeseen once in a hundred years, something, uh -huh. some, and then the, the response by governments, uh, in my humble opinion, over response and therefore causing uh, the lockdowns, which caused this repercussion of, of uncertainty and uh, turmoil. But um, I'm taking heart by what you said, Gershon, that this is a, um, this is not to be feared. It's to be looked at, is to be analyzed and to um, tread cautiously. But given the data and the information that is available at the moment, and thank God, information is far more available today than it was 40 years ago. Uh, doesn't mean that people are any smarter, in my humble well, opinion. Barry, I mean, it's, a good, it's a good lesson for life, right? You, you often, you rarely should focus on the extremes. You know, everything in life has a you know, a probability assessed with it. That's the comparison to poker also, right? Only one thing happens in life, but an infinite amount of things could have happened. And when we analyze these things, we have to recognize, despite all of our information that we have, the technology we've developed as society in the past two, 300 years, we still, we can't control everything. We can't predict the future. In my humble opinion, that's part of the lesson of COVID also. We thought, um, there's a, a, a Hebrew saying, a biblical saying, that it's loosely translated as, as, as that uh, people are, are too arrogant in thinking about their own ability. Just because they know a lot doesn't mean they can predict the future accurately. So when we look to do analysis on anything, on the economy, on you know where we should live, who we should marry, whatever it is in life, realize it's not... You end up making a binary decision, but there's many, many choices and many, many different things that could happen in life. Much like a poker hand. I know what my cards are. My opponent could have a wide range of cards. A good poker player is able from the opponent's actions and maybe some tells to know, to narrow down what the opponent might have, but don't you never gonna know for sure. You can never know. And that, by the way, and on that high note, that's the genius of life. That's the genius of 
doing what Gershon does. And by the way, he does it on an enormous scale, $300 billion. Everybody that's listening, we do it on our own scale with your wagering, I mean, wagering in the positive sense, $3, 3000 300000 in what you believe is the best for you. Remember, all of this is for you. So you can become happier, healthier, and wealthier. On that, this wonderful high note, wonderful Gershon. First of all, I, I appreciate it. Again, a couple of quick questions. Number one, will you come back again? Of course. This is oh, thank a you. pleasure to be here. Thank you. I appreciate that. Number two, I've asked you before what your most fervent desires are. We're not going to do it now because I know your most fervent desire is that your family should be happy and healthy and celebrate life to the full. So I'll, I'll say it for you. But uh, I want to give a blessing to everybody that's watching. And the blessing comes from Gershon and myself. And that is, we urge everybody, go forth, live exuberantly. Spread the seeds of joy, happiness, peace, and love. Go mad. Go make a difference. And really, really enjoy life to the full. Thank you, Gersh, and best wishes. Shabbat shalom. And we will speak to you again soon. Amen, Barry. Shabbat shalom. Thank you. Bye now. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Joy of Living podcast. Now that's another step towards your healthier, happier, and wealthier life. Never hesitate to do good in the world, no matter what the situation. Join us for another upbeat discussion next time at BarryShore.com. And be sure to leave a rating and subscribe to the show to get more conversations like this. And remember to share it with your family and friends, too. See you on the next episode.